Okay, I think we can start. Most people seem to be in the room. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Thursday's Reuters Institute um, for the Study of Journalism webinars. These are a series of webinars where we ask staff, researchers, people associated with the Reuters Institute to speak about some of the issues facing journalism, facing the media. I'm honoured beyond belief that I managed to persuade Professor Denise Leavesley to speak this week. She's the principal of Green Templeton College, which hosts the Reuters Institute, and most of our journalist fellows are are members of the college, but she's also been Director of Statistics at UNESCO, President of the Royal Statistical Society, President of the International Statistics Institute, and a whole range of incredibly impressive titles. But the key thing about Professor Leavesley is that she has seen statistics used as a form of public policy, as a form of control, as a form of information and misinformation. And it's always struck me the similarities between statisticians and journalists in the way they work to try and obtain accurate information and how to get it out there and it's more important than ever that journalists understand how statistics work and that's the point of today's seminar to kind of have everybody think in a very broad brush way about the role of statistics in society is and how it's meant to be understood and how we should approach it obviously with the COVID-19 crisis this is the data around this is is very very topical this is not a this is not a seminar to focus specifically on COVID-19 though I'm sure we'll be happy to take questions related to it at the end but what it is is an overview about statistics and what journalists in particular should understand about the way statistics works and and how it operates within multinational institutions I have Denise some seminar presentation on my screen so she's going to wave every now and then um, and that's <laughs> partly to say hello to everybody, but also partly to tell me to change the screen. Thank you very much, Denise. Thank you very much, Mira. And it's a real great pleasure. And thank you for the invitation. And I'm so sorry it's not in person. Um, and I won't be able to be quite as indiscreet about some <laughs> statistics as I am usually. So um, Mira gave me a lovely uh, segue into what I wanted to say. The reason why I'm always so pleased to come and talk to journalists about statistics is because I think there are huge parallels between what a journalist does and what a statistician does. I think both of us is about speaking truth to power and so that's going to be one of my sort of sub themes uh, today. Um, uh, I apologize that we didn't manage to to get the sharing screen onto my computer. I'm totally inept at, at using it so um, Mira has, has done this for me. So I'll wave for the first slide, please, after this one, Mira. So um, one of the problems we have with the word statistics is it actually means two different things. Um, it means the numbers or the data themselves, but it also means the science of understanding and interpreting that data. Um, and when I'm describing the science of statistics to people, I talk about it as being the science of, of looking for patterns in information and trying to examine relationships uh, so looking at how those patterns are related to other um, to other data um, trying to separate signal from noise and i think i'll come back to that because it's an important aspect of, of statistics and i often describe statistics as the science of uncertainty in fact i have a t-shirt that had I not been locked down in Oxford, had I been at my home in Kent, I would have been able to put on for this talk, which is being a statistician means never having to say I'm certain. Um, and I think it's quite a nice theme of, of uh, what we're talking about, particularly as we go into new areas, such as trying to gather statistics related to COVID. So thinking about the speaking truth to power, um, I have this wonderful, a uh, wonderful uh, um, cartoon that was sent from Tom Hanks to the White House press corps that says, keep up the good fight for truth, justice and the American way, especially for the truth part. Those of you who uh, go and listen to YouTube should, if you haven't already heard it, listen to the Obama speech to the, um, the press correspondence dinner in his last year of being uh, president. So it's the dinner held at the White House, where he talks about the importance of journalism, informing citizens, holding governments to account, 
very, very interesting because I could have, I could have given that part of the speech if I could talk as powerfully and effectively as Obama, but I could have replaced the word journalism all the way through with statistics. It's exactly the same issue. So we move on. So statistics are fundamental for evidence-based policy and for decision-making. And I think all of us will appreciate, you know, as we listen to the radio and watch TV at the moment um, and read our newspapers, that statistics we trust are essential for a healthy society, that they're absolutely essential to enable us to make well-informed decisions. Um, but I also want to highlight that they are enlightening through making explicit what's known, but also what isn't known. So we've got a talk in um, Green Templeton College later today about social care. And it's very interesting that took, it took a long while before we started to get good statistics about deaths from COVID in the care system. And so things that um, don't, don't get prioritized within society, often you have, uh, you're in the situation where you have poor information about them. So, um, so I think one of the critical issues is who is setting the statistical agenda? Who is deciding what's collected? Um, is that statistical agenda set centrally by national governments? Is, is, can local users have an influence? Can users in general influence the agenda? Because it's this issue that what isn't collected tells you something about the priorities of government or the priorities of society. And quite often what we find is that our statistical data collections miss people on the margins of society. They miss the sort of the uh, underrepresented, if you like. Um, so uh, policy-based evidence has become something of a mantra, but I really love this, this Keynes quote. I think it's somewhat tongue in cheek, but there is, an, there is a sense of truth in it, that there's nothing a government hates more than to be well informed, for it makes the process of arriving at decisions much more complicated and difficult. And that's particularly the case when the science or the statistical information isn't clear or there is uncertainty around that statistical information, then it's extraordinarily difficult for governments to take, take account of the information and to use it. Um, so we might come back in discussion to consider that quote. Um, statistics are of course critical for decision making, but really going back to the first thing I said, like responsible journalism, they're also about serving to empower. So they enable us um, as citizens to call our governments, our public servants, people who are making decisions um, to account. And I think they're an essential part of, of any democratic system because they provide a window on society. And I'm using democracy there in a very, very broad sense. Um, but I earlier said that statistics need to be trusted, and uh, I think that's really important. So we want them to be trustworthy and, trust, and trusted. And both of those are important. You don't want a society in which you've got untrustworthy data being trusted, and nor do you want the situation where you've got trusted, you've got trustworthy data, but society is just not using those data effectively. So we want to try and avoid um, fights about the data rather than about the issues that the data are exploring. Uh, so I come back to the fact that statistics really need to be the currency of public debate. Um, really great book by uh, Anthony Selden on trust. And he talks about trust at two levels, that trust is necessary for good government that a government which is trusted has higher levels of legitimacy and there's a greater willingness of its citizens to comply with its ruling. As we in this country come slowly out of, out of um, uh, lockdown, we're seeing this in, to an increasing extent. We're seeing um, that those people who trust the government are more likely to comply with 
the instructions they're given. And those people who doubt that, who have concerns about the, logis the, the uh, validity of the data, um, uh, are much more likely to um, avoid the rules or to, to um, not to follow the government rules. And the other level is that a government that doesn't trust the public hems it in with mechanisms of accountability and surveillance. And a lot of us working in the public sector have seen this happen. We've seen our public sector bodies um, being over-regulated with huge, huge requirements in terms of reporting statistical information um, and not the government just not trusting the professions and the public bodies to make decisions that are appropriate. Um, so a critical issue for you as, as journalists is how to decide whether or not to trust the statistics. Um, and I know that some of you find statistics rather frightening. You, you know, you maybe haven't had very good education in relation to statistical uh, um, expertise. Um, the education in many, many parts of the world is really quite poor with respect to statistics. It's made into quite a frightening subject. And so there is a tendency sometimes to think if, if there is a number attached to something, it must be right. It's, it's uh, some sort of magic process. And I'm going to come back to this later, but I want you as journalists to be asking exactly the same questions as, of statistics that you would of any story. You go and you check the provenance and the source of that information. So an important part of your craft is to establish the incentives to report particular results. Um, governments can dislike uh, uncomfortable news, particularly when it's close to elections. Academics are rewarded for new and exciting results leading to, to biases whereby um, uh, research that has found exciting or, or innovative um, findings are more likely to be reported. So it's really important that you actually understand the incentives to report in particular ways. My, one, my second to last point on this slide, but understanding the provenance of the data. How are they collected? Why were they collected? When were they collected? By whom? Um, what quality assurance processes took place? Um, what methodology was used? Do these data relate to the whole population or only to a sample? And if they relate to a sample, then how, how was that sample selected? Is it representative? Um, have we got good participation? Because often, even if it was a great sample, but a large part of the population who have been sampled refuse to participate, um, then we no longer have a representative sample. So all sorts of questions to do with the provenance and the source of the information. And don't be misled by big data, large data sets. Um, there's a, a great American statistician called Brad Efron, and he talks about how people are misled. They think that if there was an enormous amount of data, it must be right. Um, so it isn't necessarily right. Um, you need to understand the, the, uh, uh, the quality of the information. You need to understand the representativeness. Of relevance of this, uh, to this also is, of course, the expertise of the statisticians and the independency and the transparency of the systems. And what quality assurance has taken place? Have there been checks in terms of looking at the validity of these data? Have there been comparisons with other countries at similar stages of development? Um, does, does the data look as if it's valid? Okay, so, um, uh, so we move on to the next slide. The critical issues are, are the statisticians shielded from undue political pressure? 
And what happens when statisticians produce uncomfortable truths? Are they allowed to produce uncomfortable truths? Um, if we were in a, um, a, uh, a small room together, I might talk about some countries where statisticians have been stopped from producing uh, uncomfortable data, um, have even been removed from their jobs when they have sought to do so. So the same sort of difficulties that you as journalists experience can, can be experienced by statisticians also. Do the politicians or other reporters of the data seek to distort the results? Do they produce alternative facts, not mentioning any, any names, but um, issues to do with the, the, uh, the reporting of the data? Who appoints the statisticians? And importantly, what's the relationship of statisticians to the media? Are they together free to report their findings? What have we got a strong relationship between those two groups? Okay. Um, quality of statistics is multidimensional. Um, and I use this slide quite a lot when I'm talking to uh, to young statisticians as they're developing their, their expertise, because um, you need to take into account so many different aspects of the quality of information. And uh, too often it's assumed that we're just talking about, um, about statistical validity, but there's many, many other aspects. And I hope you know, you'll uh, focus on the different aspects through this slide. So I'll talk about some of some of those now. Um, so quality isn't an absolute, and we have to think about fitness for purpose. Um, timeliness always has to be a, a balanced against other aspects of data quality. In the Obama speech that I talked about earlier, he says that one of the concerns he has is that journalists are often pressurized to um, focus on speed over depth. Um, and that is particularly the case where you have, uh, you have limited resources or you're trying to beat somebody else to a story. Um, the same sort of pressures are on statisticians that it is assumed that up-to-date information is more important than quality information. And sometimes it is. My word, at the moment, we need really good quality information, for example, on the deaths in, uh, due to COVID and where they are occurring, where they're occurring in terms of, of the place that they've occurred and the region of, of the countries, the country they've occurred in and so on. So timeliness is critical and probably timeliness is more important than absolutely perfect data. We can accept a little bit of uncertainty or error around the data. Other kind, times, the quality of the data is more important. And indeed, fast data may be misleading. So I used to have responsibility for the data on, um, on deaths in hospitals when I worked in the NHS. And one of the difficulties we had at that time was that we got, um, we got death data by, uh, by circumstances of death through on a quarterly basis. And there was a lot of pressure to produce this faster, to produce it on a monthly basis. And the argument I would make is that actually quarterly data, so smoothed over a larger population, was more, uh, more useful than monthly data that would have ran a lot of random noise a particular hospital might happen to have had difficult cases in a particular month. So you have to balance this sort of smoothing with, with frequency. Um, the data requirements, if you're looking at change over time, rather than one point in time, are very different. Um, are we trying to make comparisons across different parts of the population, for example? So, Quality isn't an absolute, and I can only answer whether data are good in the context of good enough for what? What are we using them for? 
what decisions are we making as, on the basis of these data? Um, I mentioned comparability there, and comparability is really hard. Comparability is, of course, over both time and space. So we might be looking at what the changes in the death rates due to COVID today versus two months ago, or we might be looking at what are the uh, death rates at this point in time compared to Italy at this point in time or the United States in the, at this point in time. Um, a colleague of mine used to say that comparability is only skin deep and there are lots and lots of challenges to comparability and I've given just some of the examples here and I'm sure you can think of others. Um, unfortunately, we sometimes find that politicians, and this has particularly occurred recently, have uh, taken advantage of the fact that you haven't got perfect comparability to say we can't compare. Um, and I think that's very unfortunate because we're often in the situation where we can compare. There, there are issues to do with the uncertainty or the error associated with uh, making comparisons, but to throw out the whole possibility of comparability on the basis that there are differences is very unfortunate. So, and that is sometimes driven, of course, by pol political reasons. And that leads me really nicely on to um, the very striking feature of the public services these days across many countries of the world, that the rise of performance uh, monitoring. Um, and I think all of us would agree that performance monitoring when done well is so valuable. It enables us to call governments to account. It enables us to look at whether um, change is occurring. Um, so, you know, the examples these days is the, the data that we've been very focused on in this country about the number of people who've had access to PPE or the number of people who've ac had access to, to testing. It's a really important part of, of public services. Um, but there are dangers with it. And one of the critical dangers is that governments are often in control of both monitoring and being monitored. Um, and that increasingly data are expressed as targets and some of the data are used for naming and shaming. So they put data right in the firing line of of um, the political process. Um, there was a wonderful paper a few years ago by the Royal Statistical Society called The Good, The Bad and The Ugly on performance monitoring that gets this balance really beautifully where yes, we want good statistics for performance monitoring, but we have to be very careful. And one of the things that I found really interesting over the last few weeks is in this country, we've had politicians setting their own targets um, and then uh, being so committed that they're willing to manipulate the statistics in order to show that they've met the target. So that's going to be my theme for my next few slides, which I'll go through a bit quickly. Um, one is Goodhart, who's a wonderful economist says when a measure becomes a, a target, he see, it ceases to be a good measure. Um, a slide I use that I love from, I'm afraid it's very uh, UK centric, but the chief executive's NHS target game. Um, one of the difficulties we have is because it's hard to measure what's really important, we often measure something else. And then we can be in the situation where we're devoting uh, our resources to achieving the wrong target. And the unintended consequences of that can be really severe. So, for example, in the United Kingdom and in some other countries now too, academics are called to account in terms of research excellence framework. And they have to produce a certain number of publications and so on. And what you can find is that the resources are then being devoted to getting the publications out rather than doing the high quality research. So we can distort, distort the system 
through um, the statistics that we put in place. And I could give you many, many examples, including some at the moment. Um, so this is what I call hit, hitting the target but missing the point. Um, a wonderful quote from Robert Kennedy um, some years ago about the fact that many of the things that we measure aren't actually the things that are really important to us. I, mean, I won't go through the whole of this quote, but really the theme of it is that, is that, that, that what we care about often isn't what we're measuring. And at the moment, you know, with um, the, the upside of this crisis has been that it's made us stop and think about what the priorities are. Um, and it's very interesting, the sort of the tension between the priority of the economic measurement versus the health measurement, and when we get that right. It's very interesting. And I think many of us have been worried about this for a long time. I'm going to, to uh, quote from um, the uh, move from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. And this whole issue underpinned that move, that there was a concern that the Millennium Development Goals were really about an unrelenting pursuit of growth, sometimes at the expense of other things such as the environment. Concern too about inequalities within our society. Um, and the issue that I come back to right at the beginning that, that um, uh, statistics is partly about giving visibility and if we're not giving visibility to the disenfranchised, the people in margins of, of our society, then we're distorting policies. Um, and the challenge about whether we spread what we collect across a very large number of different indicates, indicators or we concentrate on a few. So there's been far too much of a focus on just the growth just on the GDP of countries. Um, and I've been at meetings where ministers of, of um, finance have extolled the, the fact that their GDP data has improved without recognizing that sometimes the impact of this has meant that there's greater inequalities within their societies, that the, the growth has been at the uh, to the disbenefit of some parts of the society. So I could have said right at the beginning that statistics is the science of variation. Um, and I feel very strongly that there's too much concentration on the average and not enough uh, on the variation within our societies, such as inequalities. Um, so for me, as well as being the science of uncertainty, it's also the science of variation, allowing us to look uh, across uh, the piece. Um, another nice quote from David Poyle's The Tyranny of Numbers, which is a good read, a very depressing read, but a good read. And he talks about this paradox that if we don't count something, it gets ignored. And if we do count it, it gets perverted or it re risks getting perverted. Um, and I think that's a nice way of summing up what I've just been saying. So my last minute or two before I turn to your questions, um, I should say something about global data because as, as Mira said, I was director of statistics at UNESCO and I had responsibility there for statistics right across the world relating to education science, technology, culture and communications. And uh, so we were collecting data um, right across all different countries of the world, um, such as the number of children outside of primary education, um, uh, such as the number of teachers with teaching qualifications and so on. So, this is done for reasons of accountability of national governments and of international agencies and so on. It's done in order to ensure that we're putting funding in the right places. It's done for advocacy, so resource mobilization and advocacy. 
but it's also done for comparative purposes. An understanding of oneself is gained through knowledge of another. And I think we've seen this over the last few months, haven't we, as the, the COVID epidemic has hit one country after another, that it's really important that we build an understanding through policies, good understanding of policies, but good understanding of the statistics about what countries have achieved and why they've achieved it. So comparative information is really important. Um, and there's then the difficulty as to what do we, how do we decide what to collect globally? Um, and the main ways this is decided is that governments sign up to goals and commitments at various regional, world and regional summits and they're party to conventions and agreements and they accept, accept commitments to measure particular um, statistics as part of aid packages and support systems. Um, but that's a very slow process and um, yeah, the power has been held by the richer countries. Um, there are some shifts away from that statistical colonialism, but there's still the problem that resources are very differentially uh, distributed across the world. So resource issues remain critical. We've got countries of the world who don't even know what their population data is. The idea of them being able to measure um, something like the number of people who uh, have tested positive for COVID, if they haven't got a national health system, if they haven't got a good statistical system, it's just pie in the sky. Um, there's always this tension between globally determined and locally specific data. We see this um, across everything we collect. Um, so, you know, if I'm collecting data about uh, how many children of primary school age don't have access to primary education, um, the difficulty is, is primary education de defined in the same way in each country of the world? No. Um, so if primary education starts at age five in one country, six in another, seven in another, what do we do to try and get comparable data? So um, there's always this tension. Um, we want the globally de determined data, but locally specific data is really the valuable data that is used for, for the local uh, decision making. And how we ensure that the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, meet the needs of both cutting edge and trailing countries. And especially when the, the power has been held by the richer countries, the tools are owned by the richer countries, they have the resources to go and determine what's collected and how. Um, I'm summing up now. Um, a, a quote from Lord Kelvin, um, along the theme of count numbers, only numbers count. When you measure what you're speaking of and express it in terms of numbers, you know something about it. When you cannot express it in terms of numbers, your knowledge of is, is of a meager kind. Um, I, as a statistician, I don't agree with that at all. <laughs> um, I think there's all sorts of information that is extraordinarily valuable about people's direct experiences and so on that I can't express in numbers. So I'm much more in the sort of Robert Kennedy uh, camp. But Lord Kelvin's quote has um, a lot of resonance and figures have this spurious credibility and they're often wielders, wielded like weapons. And we see in our, in our parliaments across the world, um, the government in power and the opposition uh, hitting one another with statistics. Statistics out of context, statistics of very variable quality. Um, so my, my last slide is the one that is really the theme of what I want to say to you is that your journalistic skills remain critical. Um, I would hope you're still being skeptical and asking questions, not being beguiled by the fact that they're numbers. Recognizing that numbers can be made up in just the same way as words can, 
Um, they can mislead. They can be misreported deliberately or through ignorance. And too often, statistics are trusted simply because they imply a sort of scientific precision and people are scared to challenge them. And there hasn't been an appropriate investigation of their validity. So all of the skills that you have developed as journalists are just as important when you're using numbers. And I should have finished with my favorite Snoopy cartoon, which is that uh, Snoopy is saying, did you know that 94.683% of statistics are probably made up? Um, it's probably not the, quite the right uh, uh, cartoon to end a statistics talk on, but I, I'm wanting to convey if you haven't gathered it through the last through living over the last few months, um, the the value of statistics, but also the concerns that we need to have about their validity. So I think I'm happy to take questions. Denise, thank you so much for that. I always love listening to hear you, listening to you speak. And as you said, I wish we were in a room so you could tell us your wilder stories about that include what life and death and lots of whiskey. I, I just, I'll do type questions into the chat room and I'll put them to Denise. I'm going to take the chair's privilege and ask the first one, which is you've talked about figures being wielded like weapons and you've also talked about trust, trust in society and trust in statistics. And it strikes me that we're at a particularly dangerous moment with that at the moment where statistics are being wielded as weapons very, and you know, as very imprecise, as very wild, badly made weapons. And it's seriously undermining trust in both journalism and government and statistics. I just wonder what you thought. Yeah, and science. And science. I have really worried in this country over the last few days that there started to be a battle about whether, whether the politicians were driven by the science or whether the scientists were wrong. And I mean, we will have uh, a review at some point, and I'm last, I'm not the right person to defend the scientists in an area that I'm not a specialist in, but I would say that I'm, uh, I'm very conscious that in the early stages, um, we knew very little. We, we're learning as we go along. The science is building as we go along. So my, my issue about statistics being the science of uncertainty is really relevant here. That one of the difficulties is that if you look at the early science that was informing the government, insofar as it's been made available, one of the things I haven't cut, touched on is transparency. And I'm a great believer in transparency of of statistics and transparency of scientific advice. But insofar as you can look at what's available, um, some of the estimates looked a bit too certain for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very used to actually looking at really quite big error margins and so on. And so uh, one of the difficulties is, I guess, that politicians, decision makers, find it quite difficult to know how to use information that has huge uncertainty bounds. Um, I mean, we're all facing this at the moment. I'm having to plan what the college will do over the next year. I don't know what will happen to physical distancing. I do not know how much of the teaching will be online, how many of the students will be here. The uncertainty bounds are huge. And I know how difficult that is because I'm not sleeping at night for worrying about whether I'm making the right decisions. Um, so it, it's a very difficult situation, but I hope, I hope that we won't get into this position where we are, um, we're trying to, to um, blame um, science when science was relatively uncertain. I mean, related to that is a question from um, Atik Shaikh about, about the kind of the idea of permanent scorecards relating to COVID-19. So you have these TV screens that show the numbers growing and how each country compares to each other. And his question is, while there's no denying that the numbers are obviously an integral part of the pandemic and play a part and part of a role, 
the media outlets seem to be focusing on fresh detection, fresh deaths, and it's kind of creating anxiety in a population that, especially amongst people who wouldn't necessarily understand what a growth curve is or an exponential growth is and projected curves and actual curves. Do you right. think the kind of yeah. thrown out I, <laughs> I've got so many views on that. I mean, I, I could give a whole, whole day's talk on that. Um, there's been some really bad practice mm -hmm. in terms of the presentation of statistics. Um, uh, we shouldn't just focus on the UK, but, but uh, Boris Johnson on his Sunday night talk uh, uh, 10 days ago had graphs that had nothing on the x-axis and nothing on the y-axis. I had no idea what the graph was showing. And it was almost as if um, it was quite patronizing, I think, to the community that, that you could just uh, have a representation of something without understanding it. And you had to trust him that he was making the right decisions. And I, so I've got very frustrated by that. The journalists, I, th I think the BBC, I'm, I'm hoping that this will be the savior of the license fee for the BBC, because I think they've been fantastic. And I think they have tried to get the balance right. I've got a bit annoyed when I get a lesson about the, what the R number is 10 times every day, but okay. But they've tried to communicate well, um, but they are in a difficult position because one of the things that I guess they need to do is they need to give some of the bad news stories in order to keep people still respecting the lockdown and still understanding why they're doing it. Um, I mean, I know being here in an Oxford college with there are 200 or so of our students are still in Oxford. And the majority of them are in their 20s and early 30s. The majority of them haven't got underlying health problems. They're not actually the population at risk, yet they're having to make huge sacrifices. I have staff who are furloughed, who aren't the population at risk, but they're having to forego their work. And it's very difficult to communicate in that sort of very tense environment. So I, in general, I've been quite impressed, but some of the use of statistics has been very poor. Um, it is interesting. I mean, uh, we had, we've had some wonderful politicians from other countries. I mentioned particularly Germany, but also Sweden, where we've had senior politicians give quite fantastic statistical talks on what they know about COVID and what the impact is and, and uh, how you should read the death statistics and so on. So there have been some great examples of how you can communicate statistics well. Thank you. I have a question from, linked to that from Yako is, as well as the COVID-19 statistics, if you look at all, all areas of statistics, which fields of statistics in your view are particularly politically volatile at the moment, both in the UK and abroad, that kind of like unemployment data health statistics? Um, well, I mean, the, the, uh, depends whether you, you're talking about statistics relating to the past or you're also including in statistics forecasts. Mm. And it's debatable. Some statisticians would say a forecast isn't statistics. I, I think a forecast is statistics. It's, it's drawing conclusions from patterns in da and data. It's making assumptions about the future in order to make uh, estimates. Um, so, I mean, the most volatile and the most difficult there are going to be the impact of this economically. Um, so uh, actually understanding what this is going to mean for the wealth of countries, but critically about what it's going to mean for parts of our population. I mean, I think most of us have got really distressed and upset about how um, there are certain parts of our population that are really suffering uh, economically. Um, and I mean, the self-employed, the small businessmen and so on. So those data are going to be very, very tense in the future. Um, on the other hand, data that are looking positive, uh, some of the, um, the data that we've got on the environment, we're seeing some real positives as a result of this. And so I think trying to learn lessons, I mean, I, 
quote Churchill when I say, why waste a good crisis? Um, there are some things where we can learn some lessons. And um, one of the things we're thinking about doing within the college is maybe having a, a seminar series on how do we use this experience to build a better world for the future? Thank you. Now for a question more relating to journalism, and this is from Shazia, who's a, one of our journalist fellows in Norway, and she's a very well respected um, investigative journalist. She's talking about in, in investigative reporting, big data and computer assisted reporting is a huge thing. And so you have situations where journalists are gathering their own data, often through freedom of information acts and then analyzing it and disclosing the findings. So they're kind of creating data sets and then analyzing them themselves. What would you say is the most important thing for investigative reporters when doing this? Or what should they remember? Um, for me, the most important thing is representativeness. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you're collecting your own data, very often you're collecting data that is accessible or it's from volunteers or, you know, or it's people who have provided you this information in some way. And it's why I quoted Brad Efron, because a lot of the data that we get, we, we call big data. Um, has is byproducts of um, administrative processes or byproducts of technology and the big issue is representativeness um, so I would rather have a small carefully I'm a sampling statistician so I have to put up my hands and say you know that that's my my expertise and I'd rather have a small well selected representative sample than I would a large amount of data where I don't know what the biases are within that data. Um, so representativeness is the key issue that I would raise, particularly when we've got volunteer um, samples. Thank you, that's a really good point. Um, going back to your point about communicating uncertainty, and this is there's few people have asked questions related to this, and Daniela Pinheiro from Brazil. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, in particular, you had numerous mathematical models produced to forecast various futures of the coronavirus, and and you know, and that was kind of there were fights about who whose model was right and which was the <laughs> who had the right word. And for the public, this was very confusing and frightening, I think, as you know, the way. And do you think it could have been communicated better? Should these models have been publicly discussed? And if, should they have been public discussed with more transparency? What, what do you think could have been done there? It is difficult. It is difficult because, I mean, people, people want certainty in a situation where there wasn't certainty. Um, and uh, how you try to um, reassure people that you're trying to use the best evidence, trying to make the best estimates that you can, but you can't be sure about these and that you're learning all the time. And we have been learning. I mean, it is, uh, it seems like years, but actually it's only a few months ago since this all happened. That, that is difficult. I think it's hard to get the balance right. Um, there have been a good, a few programs that I think have been exceptionally good, but they're not listened to by the general public. They're listened to by people who already care about these issues. But I would, I would say that if you go back and listen to more or less on the BBC, which is led by Tim Harford, who is the, um, uh, Tim Harford wrote The Undercover Economist. Um, and uh, he, he in the more or less program, I think has been doing a fantastic job to try to explain the issue of uncertainty. He did a really fantastic program on whether the testing target had been met and whether that was fiddling of statistics. It's a great program. He also did a really interesting piece on the deaths that we're seeing in the community that aren't directly due to COVID, but are indirectly due to COVID because people have, may have stopped going to hospitals or their doctors and so on. And that's really interesting. And um, 
I got in touch with him recently because, uh, no, I got in touch with the RSS recently about this issue because I'm very interested in whether those data have been gathered in other countries too. So I haven't seen those data for other countries. Um, so I don't know if any of you know if data on what I would call excess deaths. So we have the problem that we have death statistics and we have, uh, we have the doctor puts down the cause of death, right? Which might quite clearly be COVID. But increasingly deaths are occurring at the moment with no doctor having seen the patient before. So the doctor is trying to make an estimate as to what happened here. And so they might not be confident to put down COVID because they might not be sure. So we've got some deaths which might be due to COVID, but they weren't put on the death certificate. And then we've got deaths that probably weren't COVID, but are excess in the sense that we wouldn't normally have anticipated them. But people didn't go to hospital. And insofar as they are occurring amongst the older population, we statisticians use this horrible term, and I do apologize for it. It's called harvesting. And it's really that deaths are just being pulled forward in time. Everybody will die, right? All of us will die. The issue is when we die. And of course, for older people, what we do, what we're seeing is they're dying earlier than they would have done. So we're harvesting those deaths. I don't know if any of you have looked at the deaths that occurred uh, a few years ago when there was the heat wave in Paris, and there were a lot of old people died in that heat wave. The subsequent death data, mortality data for France showed a decrease in mortality. And there was a very interesting paper came up comparing mortality in, in France with other countries not having realized that the reason why mortality had fallen in France was because people had died earlier. So they'd been harvested earlier. And so there are repercussions of these data going on. You can't just pick one point in time. You've got to think about what that then means subsequently. And that, that starts to get really quite complex. So I, there's a long answer to your question, Mira, but I think I think it's a very difficult issue because you can't expect every member of the population to become statisticians. On the other hand, you need to reassure them as much as you can that you're trying to use the best data possible. And I think that they aren't reassured when politicians then set targets and appear to be fiddling the data in order to meet the targets. And that was very striking in what you said, the kind of setting data as targets and then using that to, in this case, shoot themselves in the foot, not to point a gun at yes. someone else. It's kind of coming back to rebound on them. And um, there's a whole different seminar we could have on communicating statistics, I know, but I'd just be interested, this is a question from Kevin Anderson, following up from the question of models, which is, how do we, what do you think the best ways are to help lay audiences understand and evaluate these models and understand statistics? Is it from what you've seen, is it things like infographics? Is it explainers? Is it repeatedly telling people what the R number is? Or, or is it about language or the person presenting? I don't find the R number very helpful, personally. I said that one of the things that I was dead against was averages. The R number is an average. The R number is going to be different for different parts of the population, different regions of the country. I don't find it very helpful, but uh, that's you know, that's my view. It's it, one statistic I would use. I would use many more um, additional statistics alongside it. I, I would use um, statistics. I, I would have set up a, a testing system in the beginning with a random sample of the population and have gathered that. That's now being done by the Office for National Statistics, but it's very late in the process. So, um, so I worry when we have an over-concentration on one number. Um, one of the things that I think has improved dramatically over the last few years is the high quality of infographics that are coming out from, from journalists. 
Um, and I think we've got some really great data journalists who've been doing good work in this. And I think they're far superior to most statisticians. Most statisticians are not very good at their communication skills. Um, and, uh, you know, there are exceptions. There's a few David Spiegelhalters of the world. So there are a few exceptions, Tim Harford. Um, but in the main, because, because people go into statistics, um, because they're excited by the number and the science, their communication skills aren't always that great. So we need cooperation between statisticians and journalists to improve communication skills. And where we've got great data journalists, I think it's fantastic. I mean, as the New York Times that produces, I think some of their infographics are really great. And I find they communicate to me much, much better than, than I would be able to communicate those numbers. Um, but we also have a problem that in many of our schools, we're not doing enough in terms of statistical education. So insofar as the public is struggling with this, in the future, we've got to start further back in terms of helping people understand data um, uh, at school and, and better statistical education has to be important. And final question, I've looked at that, which is from Veronica Pedrosa. And she's saying, when you hear the politicians and journalists quoting statistics at each other as part of the kind of jousting of politics and yeah. media, <laughs> do you think this undermines the credibility of statisticians in the yes. eyes of the public? <laughs> yes, absolutely it does. Um, and sometimes I blame journalists too. I'm not just going to blame, uh, by blame politicians. I have been caught between politicians and journalists, where the politicians have wanted the good news stories and the journalists have wanted the bad news stories because they're more provocative and they get higher headlines. And some of you are under pressure from your employers and so on to produce more controversial statistics. And sometimes statistics aren't controversial. Sometimes data are boring and we need the boring results as much as we need the controversial, exciting statistics. So sometimes I'm caught between the two, with one set wanting the, the really exciting results and the other set wanting, um, wanting to, you know, the good news stories and so on. And I've been in press conferences with ministers of education where they've been giving fictitious data about their education system. And then the journalists, unfortunately, have challenged with data that is just as fictitious in the other direction, instead of actually really working hard to do their research, to work with statisticians to ask what the right questions are. So I've been caught in the middle a number of times. So I wouldn't only blame politicians. And it's not just politicians, it's all decision makers, isn't it? I mean, we, we all want to put good news stories around what we do. Um, so, yes, it, it is a problem. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons why if I get in a taxi in this country and I'm asked by the taxi driver what I do, I never say I'm a statistician because I know that whenever I say I'm a statistician, that they will just come up with, oh, have you heard about lies, damn lies and statistics? As if I've never heard it before. <laughs> so I just say, I'm an academic or I, you know, I work in a college. <laughs> I never know, I'm very delighted that statisticians are amongst this group of politicians, academics, journalists, that everyone rolls their eyes over. <laughs> I think we're living in a kind of really perilous, fascinating, unnerving time. And it's a moment where reliability, reliable data, good journalism, holding power to account is more important than ever. And Denise, thank you so much for taking the time. Okay, thank you. And I've seen that there are some questions that we haven't got round to ans asking, answering. Um, if I can help, I will answer some of those directly if I can. But oh, please do. Well, there's one very quick 
Kwan, um, if you have a moment, which is from Manisa, which is, can you please identify a few interesting areas of research on data journalism and the use of statistics by journalists? Okay, fine. Um, right, they, both the American Statistical Association and the Royal Statistical Society have, uh, have prizes each year for good statistical journalism. If you go to the websites of either of those two organizations and look up their, their prizes, then you know, look at the material being produced by those journalists. I think those are good examples. Um, I've already mentioned more or less. I'll think about whether there's others that, uh, that are good examples, because I think one of the things, what we used to do in the Royal Statistical Society is we used to have something in our journal called Forsooth, which was um, ridiculing a misuse of data by a journalist. And a few of us got together and said, this really isn't very helpful, setting us up against another profession instead of working in cooperation with that profession. So a few of us stopped that happening and instead set up the statistical prize, the prize for good statistical journalism and also set up some statistical education and that so there is some on public use uh, information on the Royal Statistical Society website so I would I would encourage you to go and look at those sort of sources Brilliant. Thank you very much. We will send round a kind of follow up email with, your, with the slides from this presentation and links to some of the reading, including one by Rasmus Nielsen put in the chat about big data, the limitations of big data. So we will send all that round to you as well. And in the meantime, thank you again so much. Denise. Okay, thank you. And sorry not to see you all individually. Next time. Thank Next you. time. Yeah. Bye.